So for those of you who don't know Joseph Aldi, uh, Dr. Aldi is a special assistant to the President of the United States um, for energy and environment. And he has the distinction of wearing at least two hats, if not more. Uh, he reports to both Carol Browner and Larry Summers. And how's that working for you? <laughs> it's an extraordinary job. Um, Joe is also an assistant professor at Harvard, but he's on leave uh, during the stint of public service. Prior to that, he was at Resources for the Future. I've known Joe by reputation for several years, and actually over the course of this last year, I got to know him a lot better. Um, and I must tell you, it, he's, he's analytic, he's thoughtful, he's disciplined, he's precise, he's skeptical, he's everything you want in a public policy servant. And not only is this administration, I think, fortunate to have him, he's also one of the truly good guys in the administration, um, but I think the country is indeed fortunate, because as we grapple with energy and environment issues and look at the economics, I mean, these are the questions that are really critical to all of us going forward. And so uh, we appreciate you coming here today. And ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joe Aldi. Uh, thank you, Frank, for very kind remarks. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I apologize. I wasn't able to come earlier in the day where I think I actually would have uh, learned uh, a lot and, and may have been able to actually have remarks that would address some questions that have been posed over the course of the day, or, or perhaps even better, uh, know how to avoid the landmines uh, that have been laid over the course of the day. Uh, but having said that, it is a real pleasure to represent the administration here to speak about energy policy and in particular the role of, of natural gas and unconventional gas and how we think about uh, moving forward on, on energy policy. Uh, I have certainly benefited by a, a, a significant number of, of familiar faces in the crowd uh, over the pat course of the past year in working on energy policy, both uh, from direct contacts as well as, as in our consumption of the work uh, that you've done. So I want to uh, pass along our thanks for that. Um, in thinking about natural gas, I was trying to think through, well, what have we been doing on this in the policy context over the past year, especially uh, given that a lot of my attention of late has focused on, on how we're engaging the Senate. Um, and I realize that in a sense, and I'm no, I know I'm not the first to say this, that uh, natural gas has been treated somewhat as a sort of neglected child among uh, fuels, if you will, in the, in the policy debate. Uh, when you look into the House last year, the waxman Markey bill, uh, there's actually very little that's, that I would describe as being explicitly targeted towards, uh, towards natural gas. And this, this stands in contrast to, to what one sees as a variety of, of R&D efforts and bonus allowances for CCS that's intended primarily uh, for the benefit of coal, uh, where you see some of the allowances are set aside to cover the emissions uh, from petroleum refineries that you can think of as trying to tackle to some extent uh, issues with respect to oil. Uh, certainly when one thinks about uh, renewables, you have the mandate uh, for renewable electricity standard uh, as well as, as uh, mandates for appliance standards to promote energy efficiency. So in a sense, natural gas was sort of left out. Uh, when you look at uh, the energy bill in the Senate uh, that Senator Bingaman uh, worked on that I'm sure Bob talked about some this morning, uh, there's really not that much on natural gas uh, in that bill either. There are some about the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline. There's certainly some about uh, exploring offshore, uh, but, but clearly the focus was on other issues uh, in that bill. And, and so far when one looks at the activity in the Senate, there doesn't appear to be a lot focusing on natural gas explicitly. Now, of course, having said that, implicitly, if we're in a world in which we put a price on carbon, that has a, a material impact uh, on natural gas uh, in the, how we use it in the energy system. Uh, but it's, it's clear that outside of putting a price on carbon, there hasn't been a lot a focus on natural gas in, in the domestic policy debate. And so then I think that sort of raises a question. Are we sort of missing something, uh, both in the administration and on Capitol Hill and how we think about the policy debate? Uh, or, uh, you know, does this mean that we actually ought to be busy trying to design some new policies uh, to address natural gas? Uh, or does it mean that actually natural gas is sort of different uh, than some of the other fuels? Uh, maybe its evolution has, has been of such that it's sort of unique relative to other fuels, that it doesn't need as much sort of targeted support, if you will, uh, from different pieces of legislation. So to sort of think about these questions, I'd actually like to step back from natural gas and think about energy policy more broadly, uh, think about some of the key motivating factors for why we spend so much time uh, from the president down through the staff and throughout uh, the, the private sector and NGOs and academia thinking about energy policy. Uh, and use that to sort of provide the context for how to think about natural gas and the role that natural gas should play in our energy policy. 
And then I'll close with some thoughts about policy, and hopefully I won't take any more than about another 15 minutes to allow time uh, for Q&A. Um, I found doing se several of these that people sometimes have very interested questions about what we are doing or not doing in the administration. So uh, to start with, it's trying to think through you know, the, the three major reasons why we actually care about energy policy. Uh, in a sense, we can think about it as fundamentally about our security when it comes from a national security context, from an economic context, and from an environmental context. I think these are sort of the three pillars that everyone's familiar with that tries to motivate why we think about uh, energy uh, so much. Uh, clearly, when we look at uh, the foundation of, of industrial uh, economies, it's built on fossil fuels. It's been more than a century in the making being built on fossil fuels. That has an impact clearly because of the geography of where many of those fossil fuels are located around the world. That brings into play the national security implications. But it also really raises the, the prospect of how we think about changing the way we uh, produce and consume energy can have major economic uh, implications. And I think in recent years we've clearly come to terms with the fact that in the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, we are dramatically altering and will continue to alter if we don't change our behavior. Uh, the global climate, uh, which has raised uh, the environmental element, I would say, on par with the economic and national security, and why a, a successful, comprehensive approach uh, to energy policy needs to address all three dimensions, the security, uh, the economic, and the environmental. So when we think about this, uh, let me think through, discuss a little bit about national security and, and sort of how energy is really core to some key elements of our approach to national security. Uh, it goes without saying that our military posture is influenced uh, by the geography of oil. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You ask our planners in the Pentagon, if we were in a world where we were no longer consuming oil, how that would affect where we actually allocate our resources around the world, and, and they recognize it would have a, a material impact on how we actually make those decisions. Uh, we have a 727 million barrel strategic petroleum reserve. Um, from the economic side of me, I immediately think, well, how much is that asset worth, especially when we're running rather big deficits, but not saying we're going to sell any of it. But it is a question that comes up, and, and you're thinking about an asset there that's worth you know, north of $50 billion. Uh, it is three plus decades in the making. Uh, it is actually full as of two months ago or so. Um, and it is something where we're in the uh, process of, of evaluating options and looking at uh, the potential side at Mississippi about uh, uh, increasing the size of the reserve as called for in the 05 Energy Policy Act, uh, that's no small feat and it's not cheap. Um, but the fact that we have made that kind of investment and have by far the world's largest strategic reserve reflects clearly the national security uh, dimension of, of energy policy. And I think when we look at like what the kinds of investments we've been making over the past decade uh, to harden our infrastructure, especially domestically, uh, out of concerns about potential terrorist attacks, uh, and as we've learned, out of the potential risk posed by natural disasters, such as hurricanes going through the Gulf, uh, is, is motivated by this need to improve uh, the homeland security dimension uh, of our energy policy as well. Now, having said this, in a sense, a lot of what I've just said about national security is not the national security of energy, it's really the national security of oil. And it's because of the fact that we use oil almost exclusively in transportation, 94% of our transportation is powered by petroleum products. Uh, the fact that we have very few substitutes, certainly in the near term, uh, for petroleum and transportation, uh, makes it difficult for us to actually uh, be resilient when there are oil price shocks. And I think that contrasts quite dramatically uh, when one looks at uh, natural gas. Natural gas is not the dominant fuel in any of the major sectors of our economy. In contrast to oil, where we actually import the majority of what we consume, about 85% of our consumption is domestic, and almost the rest of the balance comes from Canada. Uh, so it's very much a different uh, system comparing the sort of global market for oil and very much the regional market we see for natural gas. Uh, where we actually see, feel comfortable with respect to natural gas, that clearly contrasts with parts of Europe uh, where they feel dependent on, uh, on gas coming from Russia, and where we occasionally have seen disputes between Russia and some of its neighbors and the use and transport of gas through their pipelines. I think another thing that sort of illustrates the differences between gas and oil is the decoupling in prices we've seen over the past year. Uh, that uh, as we uh, were in the recession by February of last year, we saw oil prices bottom out a little bit south of $40 a barrel, and then rose over the course of the spring to by early uh, summer or so to about $70 a barrel, and it's been bouncing that 70 to 80 range ever since. We continue to see natural gas prices go down over the course of the spring and summer. Um, and part of this is not surprising because we don't have the kind of trade in gas like we do for oil. Uh, 
uh, where we saw a lot of the industrial users of natural gas, their demand went down quite significantly as the demand for their end products went down. And so it's really reflecting, in a sense, serving as an economic indicator uh, of some of the more energy intensive industries of how tough the recession has been for them. Uh, having said that, if you actually buy electricity powered by natural gas, you benefited some last year. We actually saw the low natural gas prices uh, uh, pass through into uh, customers' prices in some states. And certainly we saw actually natural gas starting to displace coal uh, in, in some parts uh, of the country. Um, I think it's also important though to recognize that uh, in the last three decades we've seen industry moving out of oil and the amount of oil we use to generate a unit of output in the manufacturing sector has certainly gone down. Uh, and where natural gas and where other energy sources are able to play a larger role and where actually energy efficiency improvements have played a significant role in ensuring that the effective energy services drawn from uh, a unit of energy uh, has increased significantly. But I think, you know, when we look about uh, the differences here, clearly it's looking at shale gas is the fact that we can produce uh, an amount that was probably unimaginable 10 years ago. Uh, I actually recall working on economic analysis of the Kyoto Protocol when I was in the Clinton administration. And some people were criticizing uh, one of the models that we used, arguing that it assumed a much too elastic supply of natural gas. And I think actually by sort of 2000, people were feeling like, well, we probably can't realize the kind of natural gas that was envisioned uh, uh, in that analysis. Now we actually see uh, whether, as, as the last panel was discussing, what the numbers are on how much natural gas we think we have, whether it's proven reserves are up 50% over the past decade, if you look at some of the more conservative VIA estimates, uh, where others think that the potential reserves could increase by at least a factor of three clearly changes the game dramatically in terms of how we can actually uh, power our economy using domestically produced uh, energy. I think it's also very important when we think about the prospects for this technology and taking advantage of shale gas around the world to effectively decentralize energy. Uh, that when we actually look at oil especially, but when we look at sort of gas reserves as well, there's a concern about the centralization of the resource. And shale gas technology has a, a, an opportunity to sort of break down uh, the small cartel and allow many countries to be able to produce gas uh, if they're able to access those resources. I think the key thing though when we think about it from a national security perspective, just producing a, a lot of natural gas isn't going to make us more secure unless we find a way to displace the petroleum with that gas. That at the end of the day, I think the national security implications in our energy policy are driven primarily by our dependence on oil and our continued use of oil. And if we're not going to be able to find a way to displace that uh, with natural gas, simply increasing the amount of natural gas uh, we, uh, we consume here from domestic resources will not have a big impact on security. So let me, with that, let me turn uh, to the economic dimension. Uh, the first and obvious thing is that everyone cares about the price of energy. Uh, I can assure you that uh, while I'm busy trying to think about policy design on this or that, uh, on the domestic context or in how we engage in some of the international negotiations, whether it's G20 or uh, in the climate uh, framework, uh, in the framework convention on climate change, um, whenever the price of gasoline gets close now to $3 a gallon, they start asking questions. And uh, it's fundamentally because it's, it's the one, I think it's the one good that probably more Americans know the price of with precision than probably anything else that, that people buy. And that then translates into uh, clear interest in the media and clear interest among our political leaders. Uh, but I think you know, the, political, the economic dimension here is much more than simply what does it cost to fill up uh, my car. Uh, certainly if, we're con if we have either volatile or high uh, energy prices, that adversely impacts the decisions among uh, businesses when they're thinking about uh, the next round of investments. It certainly adversely affects families and has implications uh, when we think about our transfers abroad in international trade. Now natural gas can be different here for, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, if we're trying to think about one of the, the key economic rationales of energy policies to make sure that we have reliable low-cost energy to meet uh, our needs, well natural gas and especially shale gas has changed that dynamic where we saw gas going north of $13 uh, per million BTU just uh, 18 months or so ago. You know, my sense is when I talk to the experts, some of whom are in this room, that you know, the supply of, of shale gas is quite elastic in the sort of $5 to $8 uh, uh, price range. This suggests then, and especially given the nature of the technology where you can actually bring it up pretty quickly in sharp contrast, say, to, to what kind of resources we might uh, be able to, to, to lift through, through offshore activity. If you're able to sort of move that quickly and at those kinds of prices, 
it makes it less likely that we're going to see these kinds of really adverse uh, spikes in gas prices uh, like we've seen previously. The question, of course, is whether or not we have, have all the resources uh, in terms of, of, of bringing the, all, all, all the, the, the uh, uh, gas resources to bring up uh, the natural gas and the relevant policies to make that happen, but I'll get to that uh, in a moment. Um, I think that there's also a couple of other important economic dimensions when we think about uh, the potential for natural gas. One is the fact that uh, we're actually the leader in the shale gas technology, uh, that when we look at the fracking technology, we are actually ahead of where many other countries are. And I think this actually provides an opportunity for us as we continue to refine this technology to effectively export the technology and especially the technical know-how uh, to other countries around the world as they try to find ways to exploit their shale gas resources as well. And so when we think about this as, as, as we're uh, thinking in the context of our broader economic policy and the, the role that we envision exports playing as a key element of, of, of regaining uh, a sustainable growth path, uh, that this may be another component of that where we're able to sort of export, uh, export our technical services uh, to countries around the world for them to actually take advantage of their gas resources. The other is in the context of innovation. And uh, the President is very focused on innovation as another element of our economic strategy. There have been considerable investments on the R&D side and on deployment in new technologies, both through the Recovery Act and through our budgeting process. And I think that gas can actually play a key role here when we think about innovation, especially when we think about the power sector uh, and, and transportation in particular. So there may be ways in which we actually think about what role uh, we, we play in empowering uh, our vehicles, uh, whether it's actually through electrifying uh, transportation or whether it's actually bringing gas directly into uh, our larger heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, but there's clearly uh, an opportunity here for there to be innovation that brings these new products to market that can take advantage of the additional gas resources we can bring to bear. So let me close now with some comments on the environmental dimension of the energy, of, of energy policy. Uh, as you know, uh, petroleum uh, and coal have higher CO2 emissions than natural gas. 44% of our CO2 emissions in the United States come from burning petroleum products. In the electricity sector, the vast majority of our emissions, not just of CO2, but of other pollutants, come from the combustion of coal. And so the, clearly there's going to be a value when we think about this in the context of climate policy, when we put a price on carbon, for natural gas to be able uh, to provide reliable energy services in a way that has a much uh, uh, smaller impact on the global climate. It can certainly play a role in baseload in the power sector, where some of the other uh, zero carbon alternatives aren't quite ready to play that kind of role. Uh, it can actually play a role as well when we think about substitution uh, in uh, the residential sector, as we've already seen the transition away from heating oil towards natural gas in those parts of the country that still consume some heating oil. And I think there's a role here in transportation. And there's actually a fairly active debate what kind of role that should play, whether or not it makes more sense to actually think about uh, uh, electrification in transportation, or whether or not we actually think that we need to have uh, an expanded network of natural gas filling stations, basically, in order to enable uh, a transition over to natural gas in the heavy-duty uh, trucking fleet. Uh, we've already seen the benefits of natural gas in a variety of localized fleets, whether it's in uh, bus systems, uh, whether it's in various kinds of, of delivery truck systems. Uh, but there's real questions about whether or not one can go another step further and start displacing a significant share of the diesel we're consuming if one were to actually move out in gas uh, in the trucking industry. And I think there's some other environmental factors that need to come into play besides just climate, although we tend to get accused, and probably uh, rightly so occasionally, that we think more about climate than anything else. Uh, right now the President is meeting with 14 senators to talk about energy and climate legislation. Uh, and so these other environmental issues may not come up, but certainly natural gas can play a very key role when we think about compliance with our air quality regulations, being that it is a much cleaner fuel uh, than coal in the power sector. Uh, but I think there's a big question mark, and I know you've already had a discussion earlier today about this, about the impact of fracking on, uh, on aquifers. And, and I think this is something where, uh, to be honest, where we do not have a position, it's hard for me to imagine that with the growing scrutiny, whether it's from the Hill, uh, whether it's in a review that's underway at EPA, uh, the idea of uh, we're not going to tell the world anything about what we're doing uh, in terms of the fluids we're using, I just don't think is politically tenable. And I think the question is, what's the right kind of policy approach to deal with this? And there's a variety of ways, some that may be voluntary, some that may be regulatory, but I think the idea here that uh, we just sort of say, no, you don't need to know this uh, uh, and, and trust us it'll be safe, I'm concerned replicates the experience we had, for example, with MTBE. 
where MTBE was a very important uh, uh, oxygenate that we used in uh, motor gasoline, we found out that it started leaking into aquifers, and then you had state by state starting to regulate and effectively ban MTBE. So I have a concern that if one is sort of, sort of say, say we're just going to remain in this sort of don't worry about it, we have an exemption under the 05 energy law, you know, doesn't cause any problems, that there may be a concern that you start seeing state by state regulation that could adversely impact the development of this resource. And so I think when one thinks about, certainly when we think about in the climate context, a lot of discussion about the need for regulatory certainty, I sort of have a concern that, that what is right now sort of a, a discussion among some advocates uh, uh, of, of, of regulation, that they feel like they don't know enough about fracking fluids, uh, that continuing to try to ignore the problem does not actually create the kind of certainty that's necessary for the kind of ramping up that I think is very feasible and envisioned uh, by proponents of, of shale gas. So let me comment now on a couple of other policies. Um, clearly, uh, the President wants to put a price on carbon. Uh, he's been pushing for this very hard. Uh, he's, gonna, he's pushing for it as I speak uh, and, uh, with, with, with the senators. Um, I think that when we think about this, there's going to be a couple important uh, benefits that will play out uh, with respect to gas. Certainly, the demand for gas uh, will benefit relative to the other fossil fuels. It depends on what the price of carbon is. Uh, there are some uh, gas users that are actually quite concerned about this, that uh, industrial users believe that gas prices could spike because of the demand increase. Uh, when I've looked at the analyses, whether it's EIA, EPA, uh, MIT, some of the participants in the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, uh, in most cases, you don't see a dramatic increase in the price of natural gas. Uh, but it is certainly going to benefit relative uh, to the other fossil fuels uh, when we have a, a price on carbon. And I think that's, in a sense, the sort of targeted policy that's the benefit uh, to natural gas. And in some sense, it's sort of the, the fair policy where it says, on the environmental, uh, in the environmental dimension, uh, we care about the emissions of CO2. And putting a price on carbon is just putting a level playing field out there and say, you know, you all are facing the same, the same price. You find a low carbon way of delivering the kind of energy that we need. Uh, when we also think about what we need to do in the policy space, I think research and development is going to play a key role here. Uh, this is one where the President has been pushing Secretary Chu, and Secretary Chu has been, been heeding the call uh, to advance uh, across uh, the board our efforts on research and development. Uh, and I think there's some here that one can do, whether it's on CCS technology, while primarily oriented towards coal, clearly the post-combustion technologies would benefit uh, natural gas just as it would uh, coal uh, over time. Uh, and whether or not, uh, and we'll see as we uh, explore new opportunities for R&D investments that may uh, look in the, the transportation sector that I think would also create opportunities uh, for natural gas. Um, I think there's one area where when we look at this and we look at sort of the maps of where the, the, the shale gas uh, uh, lies, some of it's in states that actually hasn't, haven't been that active in mineral extraction of one form or another. And it may be useful for us to actually think about ways in which we can facilitate efforts in those states, whether it's some kind of sort of model statute or model set of regulations that you'd actually want to ensure that there's the kind of regulatory certainty uh, for uh, those who are extracting the resource in these states where they had, don't really have the experience with oil and gas or with coal extraction uh, previously. Finally, let me comment on fossil fuel subsidies. So this is something where last year in the FY10 budget and now again in the FY11 budget, uh, the administration has proposed to eliminate uh, all fossil fuel subsidies in the tax code. Uh, actually, to be exact, last year we did oil and gas. This year we decided not to leave out coal. Uh, and as you also know, in both the G20 and in the APEC context, uh, the President has secured agreement among all the member countries to phase out their subsidies of fossil fuels, which are dramatically higher than what ours are. Our subsidies are on the order of about three to four billion a year. Uh, you look at the, the developing world, I see estimates that are sort of all over the place because our, our data aren't that great, but they're measured in the three to four, maybe even $500 billion per year. Uh, these actually are quite dramatic in their impacts in terms of, of energy consumption in those countries, uh, quite dramatic in their impacts on, on the fiscal uh, bottom line in those countries, displaces uh, opportunities to use those resources uh, uh, for much more important needs for the poor, whether it's health care, whether it's education. Uh, this is something that actually the President is convinced is actually quite important and something that we actually need to demonstrate leadership on uh, in order to, to, to keep the pressure on, especially the, the large emerging economies, for them to phase down and eliminate their fossil fuel subsidies. Now, there are some who actually think that uh, in doing so, we're actually undermining our efforts to promote our energy security, uh, that we'll actually be producing less oil and less gas uh, 
uh, if we uh, get rid of these, uh, uh, effectively, these tax credits uh, through this proposal. Uh, Treasury's done analysis, EIA's done analysis. We think the impact on our domestic production is actually quite modest. Uh, I think what's actually more important is actually recognizing that in doing this in concert with uh, the major energy consumers around the world, that uh, coordinated action has significant benefits for us from an energy security perspective. When we saw oil prices shoot up so dramatically in 2008, part of that's because demand did not respond to higher crude oil prices in the developing world because of the subsidies and price ceilings they had on petroleum products. That the sort of nat natural sort of initial response of markets to help moderate price spikes wasn't there, and that's why even as oil shot all the way up to 147 a barrel, we saw oil consumption increase in the developing world in 2008. So that it has that fact that if, if you're concerned about price spikes, having the initial natural response of markets finding ways to economize on the use of, of fuel when there is a price spike, making sure that these developing countries have eliminated their fossil fuel subsidies will go a long way to helping with that. There's also the prospect that if the world gets rid of 300 plus billion dollars of subsidies a year, we might actually see lower energy prices. Now, that's not good news if you're actually trying to uh, lift resource out of the ground, but if you're a consumer, if you're an industrial user of energy, this actually has, has a potentially big benefit. And so I think there's this potential here that when one thinks about what we're trying to do with fossil fuel subsidies in the context of a coordinated effort around the world, uh, that it can actually benefit uh, the American consumer both in terms of the level of prices over time as well as in our ability to respond to uh, and mitigate the impacts of supply shocks uh, that may adversely impact the American households and businesses. Uh, so some policy, uh, policy issues I raised there at the end. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to our discussion during the Q&A.